Honey, what is your foot stuck in? The, the faucet. The, the faucet? You know, the little pipe that the water comes out of. Well, that's, uh, that's not the faucet, honey. Rob, I don't care what you call it. My big toe is stuck in it. <laughs> Welcome to Bottle Episodes, a podcast where we discuss very special episodes of TV shows that focus their action on a single primary location. I'm CJ. And I'm Courtney. And today we are talking about The Dick Van Dyke Show, which aired from 1961 to 1966. Specifically, the episode Never Bathe on Saturday, which aired on March 31st, 1965. Hence that January 1965 joke. Absolutely. (laughs) Uh, Which we'll get to. The uh, creator showrunner, Carl Reiner, also wrote this episode, directed by Jerry Paris. The bottle of the week is a honeymoon suite because whilst on their second honeymoon, according to IMDb, (laughs) Laura gets her toe stuck in a hotel bathtub faucet and Rob can't get through the locked bathroom door to free her. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy, indeed. Uh, The hijinks (laughs) ensue. And despite those hijinks ensuing, what I really love about this episode is that this kind of thing could happen to anyone. Right? Yeah. That begs the question, Courtney. Oh, God. <laughs> Has anything like this ever happened to you? <laughs> as far as getting stuck, I will say there are numerous people in my life with bathroom doors that, for whatever reason, stick. In fact, you and I have a mutual friend. We do. Who, for a long time, had a bathroom door that was constantly sticking. Um, And even my own bathroom door will stick occasionally, but I think I've figured it out enough where I don't have to worry about being locked in my bathroom. Insert Liz (laughs) Lemon joke about living alone as a grown woman. Anyway, uh, (laughs) but I've had, like, little cousins kind of, like, can't get out, they need help, like, that sort of a thing. But... I will say as far as the worst thing that has ever happened to me in a bathroom was I my father was teaching me to drive Mm. and I got he was teaching me to drive on the highway that day in particular. And so I was stressed out about it because I was 16 and the highway is the scary thing. So we hopped on the highway and then he took me to this diner and we had breakfast and then midway through breakfast, the stress and the adrenaline (laughs) caught up with me and my nose started to bleed like profusely (laughs) that's not the end of your body that i thought that this story was going to be about exactly right right like you thought oh courtney (laughs) this can't go well so hold on to your hat friend uh Mm -mm. it's still going so i i immediately get up from the from the little table and i rush off to the bathroom and like I forget exactly what the circumstances were, but for whatever reason, the stall I ran into was the stall that was not operable. Oh, God. (laughs) So I ran in and like there was like no toilet paper in that stall. I don't think any of the other stalls were like available. And I'm like standing there over this toilet and my nose is bleeding into this toilet. And I'm like, what do I do? And then eventually, for whatever reason, my nose stopped bleeding. I don't know what happened. But I felt so terrible because when I backed out of the stall, I looked at the door and there was a no. <laughs> this the, do do not use this toilet. It does not work. Oops. So there was no way for me to like flush any of that evidence. <laughs> and you I, left it like a crime scene. It looked like someone had been murdered. Like okay. I felt so bad. And I ran out to the front and was like, hey. <laughs> I'm um, so we need to sorry. go right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you owned up to it? <laughs> I owned up to it. Like, I went up to the lady. She was, like, super nice about it for no reason. Like, she didn't know me from anybody. And she was just like, sweetie, it's okay. And I'm like, no, I need to know it was a nosebleed and nothing else. And she was like, it's okay. <laughs> that is so, um, yeah. I don't know. It it shows such character that you yeah. have because I would have really gotten the hell out of there. Absolutely. <laughs> like 100%. Okay. I don't think I told my dad though. I think that was like <laughs> my moment of like, I can't tell you that I'm stressed out about driving. <laughs> like, like I think that was the, that was the quote unquote character flaw in that moment. I like couldn't own up to it to my dad, but I could tell this nice lady, hey, sorry <laughs> about right. your bathroom. Looks like I murdered someone. Did not though. <laughs> Just FYI. Just so you know. What about you? Has anything that I've ever done been so 
embarrassing and mortifying that it ruined everyone else's good time. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and yes, the answer is yes. Oh, My family and I were on a vacation to Hawaii. Okay. And I was 13 at the time. We were eating at a McDonald's because that's how we do when <laughs> we are in a fabulous tropical location like Hawaii. We just go to McDonald's. Listen. And <laughs> oh, it's I mean, you got to see what everyone is like in different places, exactly, right? Exactly, exactly. It's comforting. Do they have McNuggets? They we don't probably know. probably have a pineapple on something. <laughs> right. <laughs> Actually, I don't remember if they had a pineapple sauce or anything because this is the only thing I remember <laughs> from this <No>. day. <laughs> I had a retainer at the time because I just got my braces off and I was Adorable. very excited about that. And the orthodontist told me many, many, many times, do not wrap it in a napkin at restaurants when you take it out to eat because you will forget it. Oh, and man. flash forward, that may or may not be exactly what I did. Oh, <laughs> and it oh. wasn't until we were 30 minutes away that the realization slowly dawned on me. Oh, God. Mom. <laughs> Cut back to <laughs> us peeling back into that McDonald's parking lot. <laughs> Mom approaching the cash register, the, oh, yeah. the, the McDonald's associate, right? <laughs> and then cut to all of us digging through this giant trash can in the McDonald's lobby, which I don't think was very sanitary, but they let us do it. <laughs> They didn't even tell us to go in the alley or the parking lot or anything. They just said, sure, why not? Or they didn't know we were going to do that. That's amazing. That was amazing. And of course, your mother would be like, no, no, we're going back and we're digging through the trash. Thousand percent. Of course. It wasn't even a question. It wasn't like, oh, do we just pay like hundreds of dollars to get a replacement? No. Absolutely no. not. No, no, no. Mm -mm. And, and CJ, did you ever wrap your retainer? In a napkin never, again? Never, ever, never. ever, ever. See? Although I did like lose it years later and I just never told anybody. <laughs> I was like, we don't need that again. We're not repeating that again. No. 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 <laughs> Amazing. So, uh, Laura's situation here, obviously very relatable. Yes, super relatable. I'm excited to dig in and let us do so with this handy dandy plot synopsis. Yes. Rob and Laura arrive home, cutting short their planned romantic getaway. Millie assumes they had a fight, but a dejected Laura says they did not and launches into the story of their ill-fated second honeymoon. Okay, <laughs> Millie. Yeah. I just need to talk about Millie for like 10 seconds. <laughs> okay. Girl, what? Why are you in their business? Why are you like the first thing you notice is they come home and she's like, oh, did y'all fight? Girl, did you fight? I heard that you fought. You told me you fought just now. And, and, and poor Laura is like, no, I, no, that is not what happened. Why are you? Why is she in their house in the middle of the night like, in their business? Go home. No one asked you to be here, Millie. Right. right. We all have that friend. Well, I right. guess so. Jeez. What I was wondering was where the hell is Richie, their son? <laughs> so, I guess we can just assume that he stayed the night at Millie's place. Probably. I would assume so. I would assume that Richie was at her house and that was why she felt the that she had the the uh the audacity. <laughs> <laughs> She deserved an explanation as to why they were back so early. <laughs> I do think this was an interesting device. And at first, I uh, I don't have as um, ready of a memory of, of this overall show as I do other shows that we've talked about. Yeah. So I wasn't certain that this flashback device is something only in this episode. But my Google searches sort of told me that this was a device that Carl Reiner liked to do from time to time Flashbacks. as a way to, yes, to tantalize the audience. It's basically like a teaser trailer for the episode built into the episode. Yeah. Right? So we get these little morsels. Oh, she spent the whole time in the bathtub. Uh, Rob was just running around the hotel. What does it all mean? Right. It's right. a way to tantalize the audience before we get going, which I think is interesting. But what do you think? I I thought it was interesting. Well, I, I won't say interesting. I thought it was a little bit on the irritating side because I was just kind of like, can we get to the story? Like, yeah, I, I, I was waiting for the story to start. And I don't necessarily feel that this episode needed a sort of flashback to get us into the story. They could have just had us arrive at the suite 
call it a day. Um, I do. I mean, I did enjoy, you know, the the local color of Millie showing up and being a busybody. But at the same time, I don't know that they needed that device to get us into it, because as we are a show about bottle episodes, this, of course, you know, detracts from or adds to the number of locations not that they're going by our bottle episode. <laughs> right. I hope we don't offend uh, a pop culture podcast 40, 50 years from now. Right. I, I hope that Carl Reiner was obviously, you know, he was obviously thinking of us to <laughs> youths having this podcast in 2021. Um, but anyway, but but I also, you know, it just I don't feel like they needed that device to get into the storytelling, but. If perhaps this was used in the advertising, I can see how it's a cute little teaser for what's to come for the rest mm-hmm. of the episode. They want to use it that way. I get it, but I don't. It's not my favorite. I'll put agree, it that way. agree, agree, agree. So much so that h- how those feelings come when I'm watching something like this is I begin to suspect. I begin to form all these conspiracy theories in my head. Like, yeah. oh, did they shoot the hotel stuff first? Yeah. Then in the editing bay, they thought, oh, the audience won't necessarily be interested. We need to put a little something at the top. We, you know what I mean? Mm, like, I, yeah. I go into this moat. I tell myself a story that they had trouble in post-production and these scenes were meant to sort of um, paper over those troubles. They um, needed more to flush it out. Because I know that they do have that and we'll get to it eventually, but this scene is a sandwich. Like it, it's the, it's the top piece of bread, right? Yes, the meat, yes. There's the meat in the middle and there's the end. So I understand that, you know, for how the story is structured ultimately. Okay. I get it. But at the same time, I don't know. I didn't necessarily feel the storytelling needed this. I agree. And I thought that, I thought that these scenes themselves were a little clumsy. It was a little yeah. um, interviewee Q and A. It's literally just like, oh no, tell me what happened. Oh, then what happened? Oh, then what happened? So yeah. it, it feels a little rote. Did I think it detracted from the overall episode? On the whole, no. But it was sort of a clumsy start to the episode. Yeah, and and, on, and to the the tone of it in some places felt a little more serious than. I was perhaps anticipating, like, it felt a little bit like, oh, God, girl, what happened to you? Like, what actually happened to you? Like, I know that <laughs> I know that this is a comedy show and it tends to be funny. So whatever what happened was probably just silly, good, fun hijinks, which, of course, it ended up being. But like in the moment where we have Millie, like, really grilling her and Laura is just so down, like, down about it that it just the tone felt off. Like, like it oh my felt god, like, did someone die? <laughs> did someone die? Do we need to get you from Rob? Like, right. you know, wink, like wink if we need to take you out of here. Like, Millie, I have two weeks to live. <laughs> right. I found out that I am very sick on this trip. I <laughs> here's the story of how we found out. So let's just pretend that these um, th- this framing device doesn't exist, since neither of us really like it. Okay. Flashing back, <laughs> Rob and Laura arrive at their fancy hotel room, excited for their plans for dinner and a show. And after being all hot and flirty with each other, Laura goes to take a quick bath. And meanwhile, Ro- uh, Rob dons a smoking jacket, draws a mustache on himself, causing all these <laughs> amusing interactions with the hotel staff, including the bellhop, who's training to be a house detective. <laughs> he looks upon <laughs> Rob suspiciously. Due to the mustache that he's drawn on himself. Any thoughts yes. there? Thoughts. I, or do you want to wait until the thing starts, the plot starts? No, I do want to point out that this was like a little bit more sexy than I was expecting. I mean, I understand that it's like their second honeymoon or whatever, but they're like really cute. It's like, horny. It's, it's delightfully little, horny. That's the is, tone of this episode. It is so horny. Like, it's horny. Like he literally at one point says, wow, there's a lot of neat spaces in this room. And I was like, oh, my God, Rob. And you could you could hear the audience going, oh, Oh. (laughs) there was like pearl clutching laughter, if that could be a thing. I think I I think this is a a good point for me to reveal my childhood crush on Dick Van Dyke. I think this is a good point to bring that up. My adulthood crush on Dick Van Dyke. Thank and you. current, and mm. current, yeah, mm-hmm. childhood and adulthood. He's still like even watching the show now. I had those like immediate flashbacks. Speaking of flashbacks, to those feelings I had when I was little, and I'm like, I don't <laughs> understand what this is, but I appreciate it. And him specifically, Dick Van Dyke, total fox. 
We love a self-effacing, lanky slapstick expert. Correct. Okay? <laughs> Correct. Goofy and nice and apparently like super in love with his TV wife, Rob Petrie. Was. <laughs> <laughs> of clarify. course, there's plenty to love with her. We and love she, a Laura Petrie. Amazing. Amazing. And what I so I happened to catch this. So it's faded that we did this podcast today. Mm. But I happened to catch this documentary on the Dick Van Dyke show yesterday. Mm. Mm. And they were talking about how she was styled after Jackie O. Jackie O. Oh, and yeah. With that bob. Yeah, with mm-hmm. the bob and like the cut of her clothing and all that kind of stuff. And she's just so like, like lovely and sweet and just like really kind of formal. But every so often she she gets her barbs in. She gets her jokes and her one liners. She's like really amazing. And of course, Mary Tyler Moore is just generally amazing. So that's not surprising in any mm-hmm. way, shape or form. But but yeah, she's she's a total fox as well. At the risk of becoming too repetitive on this podcast, because I feel like I tend to want to shoehorn everything into, oh, gender roles at the time, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I guess just because that's naturally what I'm interested in. But I'm particularly interested in her because she makes Laura Petrie such an interesting character. I keep saying interesting. Um, Such like a character to watch, right? Yes. Like I'm never bored by her, but... Even though we have other housewives at the time, like Lucy Ricardo and Samantha Stevens, they found their power in either rebelling against the nuclear family, typical social mores of the time, right? Like Samantha was a witch, right? Right. Like Lucy did stupid hijinks, right? So (laughs) even if especially Lucy was infantilized, especially by Ricky, there was a kind of way that you could read power from those roles. Right. Yes. Yeah, um, I agree with that. However, Laura, as written, is a dutiful housewife. She is. Right. She is. Um, yeah. So I'm not trying to keep score of like every housewife character and how much of a <laughs> feminist, you know, powerhouse icon was she. But it's yeah. interesting. It's like, why do I love this character? And I love them together. But it's like it's kind of a I'm not even going to say a weak character, but it's kind of like a retrograde character yeah no i would agree with you on that i think that on paper absolutely her character is you know boring like it took me a while yes. to really realize that oh no she literally stays home and that's is all she does and she yeah she's fine with that and she's fine right. with that and, and i don't know i guess there's a part of me that really enjoys the fact that this is clearly something that she is fine with like she is not pushing against it. She's not like, this is what she wants to do. And I, and Mm -hmm. I always think of, you know, we have conversations about feminism. There's always that like, well, you know, don't, don't be mean to the ladies who actually do want to be housewives. And I'm like, yeah, no, if it's what they want to do and that is what they would like, fine. Yes. Um, with Laura, like it really actually feels like it genuinely fits her. It's what she wants to do. She's happy to be at home and raise the kid but she also has a genuine partner in Rob. And you see that actually on screen. I think that is what really makes it work. It's not like he comes home and he gets to tell his little woman about his day. Like he's genuinely having conversations with her. They are genuinely in hijinks together. They are You're having right. fun. Yeah. Um, they're yeah. both enjoying the life that they've built and created together. They've made this plan to, you know, go on this cute second honeymoon. And then there's even a moment where they are talking about finances together. He literally, you know, is like, it's fine if we got a more expensive room and the kid needed to like, his teeth don't mesh or whatever, whatever. And she's like, no, no, no. He needs his orthodontia, hon. Like, <laughs> like, we literally can't get a more expensive room. This is perfect. You know, it's, they clearly share a life together and it seems like there is respect for each other. And that is something I really appreciate about their relationship. And it's displayed so beautifully in this particular episode as well. Agree. Agree. Yes. Thank you for putting words to that, because every time I watch the Dick Van Dyke show, I do feel this sense of freshness and a feeling of being contemporary for the time. But I'm yeah. like, why is that? And I think that that's exactly what it is. It's their yeah. shared mutual dynamic that, of course, is like a pleasant little sitcom fantasy of yeah. how to navigate a marriage. But it's one that they embody so well. Yes, correct. They play off each other beautifully. And I will say this. I 
I know we're talking about Mary Tyler Moore and I know we're talking specifically about, I, I'm saying Laura and Lori. I know I need to nail that down. It's Laura, right? It's Laura. Yes. It's Laura. So I know we're talking specifically about Laura, but there's this anecdote about how Dick Van Dyke, when they wanted to cast Mary Tyler Moore, she was 23. <laughs> he was 31. And he immediately was like, I feel uncomfortable with this. No one is going to buy this. She is way too young for me. And that automatically to me felt like a, oh, he's a solid dude. (laughs) He's a good dude. Like he literally said, I am uncomfortable with this. But because she was like, I'm young. It's my big break. I want to take on this show. Not only was she able to showcase her talent, but she also ended up having a mentor in Dick Van Dyke. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of see that mutual respect at play in the way that they are interacting as their characters as well. And I really appreciate how the show ends up displaying that. And it ends up becoming a portion of their marriage, whether they intended that or not to show up on screen. It does translate onto screen. Yeah. And as long as you're mentioning her age, something that I'm half remembering right now is mm-hmm. that I read something recently where Mary Tyler Moore lied about her age in the audition. I don't know if she oh. was really 23 and she said that she was older okay. or if she said she was 23 and she was actually younger. Um, <laughs> but... Oh, God, Mary Tyler. Well, you know what, girl? Do what you got to do. She yeah, needed, right? She yeah. Job. <laughs> right. It, it kind of makes me think of something that Laura would do. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I think that Laura would do that 100%. <laughs> okay. Well... Laura calls Rob into the bathroom, but he can't get in the door. It's locked. And to make things worse, Laura announces that she's stuck in the bathtub. You see, (laughs) she was playing footsie with the faucet and got her big toe caught in the spigot. It's weird that even when something like this doesn't happen to you, my response was still, it me. (laughs) You know, it just feels so human and stupid. Yeah. I love when there's like, names of tropes and so when i read like a blog entry on this episode Mm -hmm. this trope is the one false move trope right (laughs) so you know one tiny careless thing Mm -hmm. and suddenly it causes all of these issues in terms of being a one false move it's like i can totally see myself doing this oh yeah 100 percent like just the idea that she was like, oh, the drip is coming. Oh, cute. Like, she's just not even thinking about it. She's excited to be in this bathtub. Right. She's excited to have a good time. She can't wait to see the show. Her husband is clearly trying to get her undressed. Like, she's just having a great day. And now she's got her toe stuck in, this, in, in the tub. We've Everybody's all played with a that. drip. Everybody has done that. This is and a cautionary tale. And what I love more than this is that, you know, speaking of you know, gender roles and all that kind of stuff and being like an adult or whatever. Like this is something I remember doing as a little kid. And if this grown woman (laughs) has shoved her toe into the spigot, that's really funny to me. (laughs) It's just charming. Like she's just having a good time. That is such a good point. There is a saying from someone who worked on the office. I don't remember if it was Michael Schur or somebody they were uh, they said everyone in comedy is either stupid or lying. And I've always held that like with me. And and I've always asked myself, do I agree with that as a writer? Mm. That point of view for me personally has evolved into I think everyone in comedy just acts like a child. I think that yeah. that is like sort of necessarily true. And that's why we like it. And that's why a yeah. lot of it, a lot of comedy comes from this intuitive place rather than an intellectual place. Yes. So when you say that, like, that's something you would do as a kid. I think that is why we find this funny. <laughs> Right, because yeah. we all remember playing in the bath, or we all still play in the bath today. Right, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. If my bathtub was as beautiful and as luxurious as the one in that hotel, <laughs> I'm sure at some point I would have stuck my my toe, gotten my toe stuck. Like it, it makes sense, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. It mm-hmm. makes sense 100. percent And and to that point, I would even go so far as to say that there's a playfulness, there's a childlike playfulness. In what she in what happened here, that's kind of what makes it funny is that she's acting like a little kid a little bit. <laughs> but then, too, like you see that again at play in the dynamics <laughs> with Rob. He's, you know, drawing a mustache. She's he's calling her a saucy wench because she <laughs> referenced. I can't remember the actor's name, but she referenced some actor and he thought it would be fun. David you know, Niven. He, mm-hmm. David Niven. Yeah to be playful with his wife and now he's got you know a little dumb mustache on his face and that's that's funny that's cute they're both 
these kinds of people. I think even the maid goes ahead and makes that point. She's like, you know, she's got her toe stuck in the bathtub and he's got a mustache on his face. They're right. Perfect yes. for each other. <laughs> they they feel very unpretentious. Exactly. Although flashing forward just briefly, <laughs> Laura kind of has this moment of like talking down to the maid where I was like, she oh, does. Right. what is this? What are <laughs> like little doing? darling. I'm like, OK, <laughs> I guess there's a little bit of Karen and Laura, huh? That we She's have to contend with. She had a moment. She had sure. a moment. OK, <laughs> yeah, she was in an uncomfortable situation. So maybe we'll let her slide a little bit. Um. Uh, Laura. Let's talk about the, of course, the central gag of this episode, which is that for a large portion of it, we're imagining, right? It's playing exactly. off of our imagination. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do. I love that, like, first of all, again, kudos to Mary Tyler Moore for being comedic off screen. She is just using her voice, mm-hmm. right? She's just, you know, conveying how embarrassed she is. She's conveying her worry and concern, not only for herself, but for her husband. She's also expressing irritation, her obvious Karen moment with the maid. Like, she's she's having a, to do a lot, to convey a lot with just her voice. And I mean, that's a whole segment of acting, right? That's voice acting. But, but still, for us to leave that up to our imaginations and for her to do that off screen and not necessarily being directly interacting with the people that are on screen. Right. That's a talent. She's doing great. The, (laughs) I think of a bunch of things at once. I think of this acting adage attributed to like one of the great dramatists, but I can't remember the name. I just take these morsels of wisdom (laughs) and then I forget who said them, right? It's mine now. (laughs) They stay Uh, with you, bud. Then they stay with me, right? They live on through me. No, it it goes, um, the most important thing about acting, voice, voice. And once again, voice. Uh, yeah, right. It's kind of like in real estate, like location, 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 right? You're like, exactly. all right. It's not just location, but I get what you're saying, right? I get exactly. how important voice is. And Mary Tyler Moore definitely like was a master of the voice. Yes. <laughs> but something that I want to bring up in terms of this being like a really cool acting moment for her. I don't trust this anecdote, even though I'm going to share it. According to the actor who played the bellhop, She was not having it on set. She was annoyed that she was just going to be off screen. Apparently, she spent the week quitting smoking, so she was especially combative. (laughs) (laughs) And and so she felt sidelined, according to this, what I think is an apocryphal anecdote. And the reason I have such skepticism over it, I just feel like it's so easy to think that. Like, when uh, it made me think of The Mandalorian, (laughs) when it's like, oh... Um, there's all these rumors about Pedro Pascal being upset that he's not in it enough. I think Whatever. he's fine. <laughs> yeah, I think he's he's, 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 he's a household fine. name and he has that sweet Disney paycheck. OK. And he doesn't have to be on set if he doesn't want to be. All right. But, you mm-hmm. know, to that to that actor who uh, is the bell was the bellhop, you know how women be difficult, right? Like, like that, just- that is the other thing, too. I definitely was like reading between the lines and I'm like, I think this is a women be difficult story. Exactly right. right. She probably was like didn't acknowledge him enough at the crafts table. And right. he was not happy about it. <laughs> yes. So the imagination part is really cool. And the audience at home is being titillated by imagining <laughs> a naked Mary Tyler Moore for the space True. of 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the show was already, I guess, a little bit a scandalo because she would she'd wear pants that were that were that's right for the time. Right. So, you know, she how dare she just be so alluring in her tight pants, I guess. And so this idea that, you know, the lovely Mary Tyler Moore is behind (laughs) is behind that door (laughs) naked. It's just. It's fun. That is funny. I didn't even think about that. There's you know. like extra dialogue in there just to remind the audience that she's naked. Like oh, they Lord. mention the fact that she doesn't have towels about three or four times. <laughs> it's not even setting up a joke or anything. It's right. just, oh, there's no towels in there. Right. There's okay. just no towels. You can't just so you know, just so you wear. She's right. not covered up, guys. Right. <laughs> so again, a delightfully horny episode. <laughs> The 60s. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay, so the cantankerous maid comes with a key, but it won't work. We talked about the weird class privilege thing happening there where <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> uh, Laura calls her darling 
or it's darling, right? Yeah, I think she calls her darling or something like that. And then the maid retorts deary, I think. Yeah. And then they flat out call her stupid. <laughs> When's that stupid maid going to come back? Oh, boy. OK. I, I will say this in Laura's defense. She mm. did not know that the maid was in there, which I, you know. That's even worse. <laughs> All right. Just, I feel like so many bad things are happening to Laura in that moment. And it's just kind of like, what is this stupid maid going to get here? We'll let her off the hook. We'll let her off the hook. That's, oh, <laughs> man, what a moment. Uh, Rob tries to call the engineer, but he's unavailable. Rob announces that he will try to bust down the door, and that's the end of Act 1. Beginning of Act 2, back in the our favorite framing device, back in oh. the present. Rob yes. teases Millie by saying that he had to shoot the lock off the door. So. So. Yeah. <laughs> I am all about teasing the audience, right? Yes. This part was cut when this episode was colorized and re-aired on CBS in 2018. And I think for good reason. It's like that you're revealing the whole climax. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Too far, Carl Reiner. Too far. But, okay. So we move on. Flashing back to the hotel room, Laura warns Rob that a full-length mirror in the bathroom will shatter if she tries to bust the door down. Rob advises her to cover herself with a bath mat. He makes several unsuccessful attempts to bust the door down, breaking that mirror in the process. Um, This is just a stray thought. I don't know that we need to talk about it, but I wonder how they reinforce that door because something that I always notice, especially since I mentioned last episode, I'm going through all the Twilight Zone episodes. Yeah. Those sets were like, they, they were just flats right they were just like flimsy flimsy and sometimes you could see the walls just like rocking back and forth shaking yeah and even though dick van dyke is like a string bean it really does look like he is just putting all of his force into that door and i'm sure all they had to do you know i'm sure the set designer was like okay so we'll reinforce the door (laughs) but yeah but uh, no that's a good point because i mean like i will say one thing i did notice Mm. in looking at that set was it's clear that they, they tried to dress it up and make it look like a really nice place, but it definitely felt like, oh, all of this is cardboard. Like, none of this 100%. is real. Yeah. So to see him trying to run through that door, you're right. I wonder how they did reinforce it if there was just, like, three dudes and a <laughs> yeah, mattress, right. like, yeah, propped yeah, yeah, there's up a against crew the back door. There. Like. Right. <laughs> but you definitely bring up a good point, just in terms of, like, the artifice. Mm-hmm. What's interesting and why I hate these colorized versions, because I watch the black and white version and then I like scrub through the color version really quickly. Mm -hmm. I don't like seeing that stuff because it really just makes it so plain how fake and chintzy all of this is. Yeah. Right. Whereas like the black and white definitely disguises some of that. And you can lull yourself into thinking not necessarily that this is real, but that this is happening somewhere. Right. right, right. You're in another location. You're somewhere else special. And and what's interesting is like this was filmed before a live studio audience, right? Like mm-hmm. they're actual people. So can you imagine just being like in that audience and seeing these like flimsy sets and just being like, you know what? We're going with it. It's yeah, great. Right. We're having a good time. <laughs> We've had three cocktails before we got here. Like, let's just have fun. I will say, though, that the um, the color did help my immersion in this episode, or I picked up something that I didn't with the black and white version, Mm. which is that Dick Van Dyke's smoking jacket looks ridiculous in the color version because it it is purple. It's not black or gray, right? That's amazing. To me, color-wise, that enforces the fact that this is a special night for both of them, that this situation is ruining, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) You still get that with the floofy tie, Right. Yes. yes. Um, so that's still coming through, like texture wise, but yeah. the purple jacket in the color version really like reinforces like, oh no, they wanted to do it and now they, they can't. Was- <laughs> now they're not gonna be able to. <laughs> right. She bought that pretty nighty at the hardware right. store. <laughs> oh yeah. Just to just to go back a little. <laughs> he like mentioned some sex dream that he had about her. Yes. And I was just like, okay, show, all right. Get yours. I mean we get quite a bit in this episode there's role play like he fully like drew on that mustache ready to be like we're gonna do this right now like his plan was as soon as you get out that bathtub girl we in it petri's in heat okay (laughs) oh of course van dyke's physical comedy prowess even just as something as simple as going to the door 
and then stopping short when you know she's saying stop don't and it just yeah. occurred to me well, it, to get that timing right i assume mary tyler moore would ha- actually have to be like seeing him right yes so maybe yes. she's not directly behind the door maybe she's just like standing off screen off i like screen, yeah. i like envisioning like where people are and what's happening with the cast yeah, and yeah, how they're actually <laughs> making this happen yeah, yeah. Right. but yes that's just another great example of comic timing that's kind of lost even in today's yeah. smart physically aware sitcoms just because the timing's coming from the editing but back then yes. it really was just coming from of course there's control room editing right, right. cutting back and forth between cameras but yeah. really my point is that that timing happened between the magic that is those two actors. I will say like watching it, I had, and this is a crazy thing to me to actually, I feel like say out loud because I had forgotten what a physical comedian he was until I started watching this episode and things started coming back to me. But like, even when he like gets into the hotel for the first time and he's like kind of doing like a little dance on the carpet. Cause it just feels mm-hmm. good and plush. Right. And he's like, Ooh, the carpet, you know, him running at the door. Like you were mentioning, all these physical things that he does. And this this episode does not require him to do a lot of physical comedy, but he mm-hmm. still works it in there yes, anyway. Precisely. And then mm-hmm. and to your point, the timing of everything he does is so precise. And in that documentary I was watching, they talked about how he got his start. He as he says, and I was like, God, I love that you're like an old man. This is so great. He called himself a song and dance man. He became a song and dance man. So he, he was not. I went into showbiz. I went into I pictures. I went into show business. A movie star. Um, but he definitely um, did not start out his career as someone who did singing and dancing. But then he got cast in Bye Bye Birdie, and that became mm. like a whole thing. And um, obviously, a lot of us know him mainly as children from like Mary Poppins and Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and all that kind of stuff. But obviously it was a skill that he kind of picked up. Like he was always a gifted physical comedian, but I think it only got better with him being a dancer and a singer. So basically this goes against my general perception of him that he came out of the womb with a straw hat and cane, just like (laughs) tap dancing away on that hospital floor. (laughs) I mean... To be honest, CJ, I don't think you're wrong. I think that is also true. That's going to be a yes and on that one. Um, He definitely is a born performer, and I think he was always kind of physically gifted, but I think it got even more honed Mm. when he started performing on Broadway. It's amazing. His timing is impeccable, and to watch him do these things, and I'm like, how... First of all, this man is like in his 30s and doing this. And I'm like, my knees crack when I stand up too fast. Like, (laughs) how how are you doing this? (laughs) Amazing. Um... I'd be remiss if we didn't briefly talk about the opening titles and how when I was a kid, I would always get disappointed when he didn't trip over that ottoman. I took that as code that it was going to be a boring episode. I was like, really? yeah, I was like, boo, boo, no, tr- give the people what they want. <laughs> you gotta fall. Right. Always. And apparently there was a third version that they only use sometimes where he trips over the rug or like he trips oh. on the rug or something. Right. Man. Uh, but yeah, hated it when he missed that ottoman. That's it missed cool. me well, with that show. Okay. I dare you. The bellhop returns with the hotel's house detective who both try to apprehend Rob because they think he's quote unquote a nut trying to get into the bathroom to bring harm to Laura. <laughs> This is just one of those stupid sitcom moments where it's like, okay, Rob, just tell them what's happening. Yeah, just tell just tell them about your wife. Just, right, just, just, just tell them use the your words, use your words. Just use your words. Right. Uh, that being said, at this point, I observed in my notes, I love that the dialogue is situational, not very one-liner or joke-oriented. There's one yes. one-liner early on, or that I would classify as a one-liner, when Rob kisses Laura and she says, Honey, what about the bellhop? And he says, you first, which I think is really funny. (laughs) Which, I will say this, the majority of the dialogue in this episode weirdly does feel very naturalistic. Like, Mm -hmm. And I will say, even the Mm one-liner, to me, felt like an aside that, like, like, my dad would say that to my mom as he was like teasing her. Like he would say, like you know, your your parents would if they're kind of quipping with each other a little right. bit. You might hear your parents give a quick zinger like that, and it, so it all felt really natural to me. Yeah, 
Yeah. Even still with all the the normal showbiz punchy dialogue, like right. it didn't feel so intense in this episode. No, true. I think bringing the house detective in there with his gun and oh, mistaken identity were were creeping into purely sitcom fantasy territory, but what I really, really appreciate about this episode that I think I've mentioned in some form or fashion, I think that this feels like a story that they're going to tell for the rest of their lives. It feels oh, like yeah. something that actually happened to people. Exactly. <laughs> right? Exactly right. Yeah, they, they definitely will bring this up at some wedding anniversary or at their next, you know, mm -hmm. third, fourth, fifth honeymoon that they try to take because, you know, they're going to take fourth and fifth honeymoons or that those people. But um, it definitely feels like something that will be repeated. And I love it. The detective and Bellhop tie Rob up. <laughs> well, they don't they don't actually get around to tying him up. There's like half chaos. There's like chaos, but yeah, it kind of yeah, it, it, it gets tangled and then it kind of gets untangled just as quickly. He really he obtains quickly, yeah. the detective's gun by asking for it. Right. And I was like, well, that was real convenient. Like, right. I was just like, oh, wow. Okay. It's a good thing he's stupid. That always helps. <laughs> Rob indeed shoots the lock off. And then uh, I love this. He he makes this big show about only a husband can can do what I'm about to do. Shoots a lock off, goes in the bathroom, takes yes. a look at Laura, walks back out, says, you guys want to see something ridiculous? Yes. <laughs> so there was always this undercurrent of this show where, you know, this is what a wife is supposed to do. This is what a man, this is what a husband is supposed to do. Yeah. And they're constant. They acknowledge that and then they break that. Which exactly. I think is a lot of fun and and very key to the DNA of this show and why it works. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I definitely agree with the fact that the show, while not earth shatteringly groundbreaking, it did, you know, try a bunch of different things that were not necessarily in the norm. You know, they weren't afraid to, again, show Laura wearing pants around the house. They weren't afraid to actually bring a black couple onto the show I at one point really love that episode. That's a fabulous episode. Let's Maybe start we'll a just... podcast. It'll be like a burner podcast, <laughs> like burner phones, like a burner exactly. podcast. We talk about that one episode and then that's that's it. <laughs> exactly. An end of show, like nothing else. We talk about nothing else, just one episode. Right. Um, it's an amazing episode of television. If you haven't mm -hmm. seen it, I can't remember the exact name I of it. I think it's called That's My Boy. That's my boy. I think. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's amazing. <laughs> and um, so while the show itself, you know, again, not super earth shattering, it did try to break the norm and, and do it with good nature and good humor about it. It wasn't a bunch of very special episodes. That's what I really love about that episode in particular. That's my boy. Yeah. It wasn't a very special episode. It was just kind of like, also, black people exist in is. this universe. Yeah, right. Surprise. Right. Hello. <laughs> Hello. And it's so fascinating to me because their blackness is a is a literal punchline. It is a True. sight gag. True. And yet just from the specific construct and context of the episode, they are not the butt of the joke. Exactly right. And they are in on the joke. Right. Right. They think it's funny. Yeah. Which, yes. you know, to be fair, like... It's 1960 whatever, and I'm getting this phone call from, you know, somebody and they're like, my husband is frantic and thinks that our children have been switched at birth. We're white, by the way. Like, you know, you would, I would I would I would do that joke. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would get in on that. That's funny. All right. Later, the engineer saws the drain off, but a segment of the spigot is still attached to Laura's foot. Interestingly <laughs> enough, when you were talking about. Oh, well, I didn't love how they opened in uh, the Petri's house because it kind of kills the bottle format. Yeah. I wasn't too bothered by those scenes breaking the bottle format. Mm -hmm. But I did think that just because they were having so much fun with engaging our imagination about what was going on in this bathroom, it kind of yeah. killed it for me that we actually cut into the bathroom. And I feel like we also didn't need that. I agree with you on that. I feel like it went, it went just a little bit past what we needed it to. Mm -hmm. um, like, because they very easily could have had a scene of the engineer going in and then Rob carrying her out. And then they have this conversation about, oh, God, we we're going to miss the show. They could have done all of that. Yes. They could have. They didn't need that extra layer it to show her in the bathtub. This is my conspiracy theory mind. It seemed almost like filler. <laughs> they were like, oh, oh, God, we need to fill two more minutes. 
that, I mean, I I wouldn't be surprised if right. that was the case. That makes a lot of sense to me too. Yeah. Back in the present, here's where it just freaking goes off the rails for me. Back in the present, Millie ties up every last remaining loose end by asking them a bunch of questions. Did they end up seeing the show? No, they went to the theater, but they were too embarrassed, especially when they ran into people that they knew. How did yes. Rob get his laundry marker mustache off? He didn't. He used makeup. Yeah. Stop it, show. <laughs> yeah, it was like we had a nice little jewel of a moment. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we needed the extra like, oh, God, we were too embarrassed to go in. And I don't know if this is maybe a us looking back on this from 2021 back to mm. 1965, mm. If, if there was more social impropriety that was involved in this that perhaps is not translating to us in our time. I could. Like, I, yeah. Like, I get the joke about, you know, OK, oh, Rob was wearing makeup over his you know laundry marker mustache. Mm -hmm. LOL. A dude wearing makeup. Like, I get I get that. But, but there is a little bit more of a like. Was it such a social faux pas that she was kind of hobbling along in her like special boot that she had made? Right, <laughs> right. I mean, maybe, foot? but but like they even say, oh, let's just bandage it up and then say that it was an injury. I think that the writers, well, I don't know if there was a writer's room. I think it might have just been Carl Reiner. So, okay. so whether it was a group of people or whether it was just him <laughs> privately mulling this over, yeah. I think... Somewhere along the way, there were all these inconsistencies about whether they saw the show or they didn't, whether, mm. you know, he got the mustache off, whether he didn't. I think that Reiner used this as an opportunity to, like, iron all of that out, the what right. about this and that. But to the point where I'm like, this is not even a scene anymore. This is just right. like uh, just um, a checklist. Dress. Yes, right. yes, yes. Here's everything that we mentioned in this episode. Let's right. just make sure all those right. those ends are loosened or tightened. <laughs> And there is one more thing that I will be snarky about. It relates to the framing device, but it's also like, I wish that they had this added sprig of something that I'm about mm. to talk about. I wish that we could have gotten just a little more about why this second honeymoon was so important to them. And, mm. and they could have done it in sitcom terms. And it could have been as something as simple and straightforward as <sighs> Laura's getting burned out by raising Richie. Rob yeah. is really slammed at work. You know, like the it could that have been as simple point. as that. But the way they set it up was like, oh, it would have been nice to have a second honeymoon. Yeah. We're just doing this because we can. And because there we was can. money left over after Richie's orthodontia. Like we could just. Right. We could right. do this. <laughs> You're right. You're right. And that would have given more spice to the framing device. When we visit the present timeline in the beginning, middle and end end of this episode, we could have seen them being intruded upon by those daily life stressors that they were trying to get away from. Exactly. And I agree with you. I, I definitely feel like the the stakes are not really there. Like the thing that they're trying to time out for is going to see a show. Right. I'm thinking back to the Friends episode. The thing that was making the urgency happen was the fact that it was Ross's speech that he was giving that it pertained to his career. Right. So there were stakes there and it made sense why he was so like intense about trying to get to that event, that event. So he could give a speech, right? This, this is just two really nice, beautiful people not making it to a show they wanted to see. And the stakes like, are not oh, well. there. Yeah. We didn't we didn't catch it. I guess that's OK. Oh, that's well, always how I feel home. at the end of these Dick Van Dyke show episodes is like, mm. oh, well, <laughs> <All right. laughs> it's fine. Oh, no, you didn't get your. Oh, oh. It's too bad. <laughs> which which is fine. And just to be a devil's advocate on my own point, Ooh, it's like okay. perhaps we laud this episode because it feels so grounded. Maybe that's part of. What makes it feel so grounded is like, well, we've all been to, we've all been in that scenario where like we wanted True. to catch a show. We didn't make it. It's all right. Like it, it does make them feel like just people that we know. Yeah. And then there's another part of me, too, that is also like we could have just stayed in the hotel room. Yeah. I mean, you know, like <laughs> right. it enjoyed the weekend, you know, like that's a really, really, really good point. The point of it, the point of the honeymoon is for us to spend time together. Granted, my toe is all messed up. Yes, I am now casting myself into this scene. Too bad, guys. Um, I 
we're already in a nice place. Let's just miss the show, enjoy our time in this fancy hotel room and each other's company and call it a day. 100% facts. And that even more makes me feel some kind of way about that framing device. Right. Okay, boo. (laughs) So to recap, we hate the framing device. We hate it. It's the worst part. If that wasn't magnificently clear throughout the duration of this discussion. (laughs) One more time for emphasis. (laughs) We hate it. (laughs) I'll put it in the show notes in case y'all missed it. (laughs) Content warning. We hate the framing device. (laughs) Other than that... Obviously, a really, really, really iconic, classic, mm-hmm. well-made, and just plain fun episode. Mm-hmm. Um, so to cap things off, how full does this make your bottle, Courtney? Ooh. I'm... Ooh. I- I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it a C. <gasps> I know, I know, I know. I'm struggling. I'm struggling. <laughs> I feel some kind of way, but I'm giving it a C. Tell us about it. And I think for me, it's the execution of it. Mm. It's the execution of the episode itself. Is it fun? Yes. Is it grounded? Yes. But I, I'm, I'm just not obviously here for the framing device. <laughs> and I feel like we ended up in bottles we didn't need to end up in. Mm-hmm. Our mm-hmm. bottle doesn't feel that pure, right? Like we have the framing device at the beginning and the end mm-hmm. and also in the middle a little bit. And then we also have that additional layer of the bathroom itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, I feel as though this episode genuinely to me feels like it could have been solely in that honeymoon suite. So I'm going to give it a C. Okay. Sorry, Dick. I still love you, Dick (laughs) Van Dyke. Fair, 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 fair. (laughs) I would give it an A minus, which like in my notes, I was like, oh my God, this feels low. Uh, and really? now it doesn't feel so low to me, <laughs> right? So that's that's an A minus, ninety percent. I wouldn't detract as harshly just because we cut to different places. I think in mm. in my mind I can sort of narrow in on the spine of this episode, and so mm-hmm. I love the charm of the Petries. This episode it takes something so small and tiny and okay. blows it up into something that sustains and sustains and sustains in terms of the comedy. So for that, okay. A minus. Thank you, Carl yeah. Reiner. All right. What have you been watching lately, Courtney? Oh, my God. So I am halfway through the Star Trek Discovery finale. I haven't finished it yet because I'm terrified. I'm scared. I don't, 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 probably by the time this comes out, I will have finished it, but I'm just scared (laughs) that something bad is going to happen to a character I love. Mm. There are so many characters that are in peril right now, and I'm like, I don't know if I'm ready, so I kind of stopped watching it. I will admit, it's been a really tough week. Uh, What's really funny is, so additionally, in addition to Star Trek Discovery, I've also been literally just glued to 24 hour news and it was there was a point yesterday it was a saturday yesterday it was so breathless the amount of breaking news that was coming i was just like i need to turn i need to turn it off so i turned it off but all that to say i'm stressed out and scared about everything right now so watching some of my favorite characters be in peril is like a bit too much so i, see. I have yeah. i have like taken a little intermission on that episode for a little bit what about you cj what are you watching i'm finally catching up on the crown which is just an utter fucking delight it is oh where are can you tell me where you yes are? i'm midway through season two okay. and so one of my favorite movies of all time is the hours directed by stephen daldry who is behind this show and like oh. you see it. So I personally, very personally, as a super fan of The Hours, which I think I'm the only one on earth who is a super fan of The Hours. If any of you listeners are a super fan of The Hours, please write. He loves that show. I mean, that movie. Right. He loves it. And it is like literally in the, my top five favorite facts about you. I you love, love it hours. more than most people. And so watching The Crown just feels like I'm watching The Hours TV show. Um <laughs> With these shots that just linger on these amazing actors, the mm-hmm. opulence, the sadness, like the the quietude of it all. Oh, yeah, so good. So good. It's like cake. Okay, <laughs> here we go. 
This has been Bottle Episodes. If you have an idea for a bottle episode from television history that we should cover, or if you're trapped in a single primary location and need to send a distress call, email podcastbottleepisodes at gmail.com. That's podcastbottleepisodes at gmail.com. Say bye, Courtney. Goodbye, everyone.